Today we're actually going to have a discussion about um, case management for individuals who we define as um, high need and high risk and um, what the different models are and how to sort of integrate the um, risk need responsivity framework model into the practice of our sort of case management. And um, before I start, um, what we're hoping to do is to um, define, what I'm hoping to do is define high risk and high need and um, sort of talk about case management um, in response responding to behavioral health needs, which is substance abuse and mental health, and then talk about the challenge that we have in also making sure that the sort of case management, whatever model it may be in terms of your case management, is also responding to sort of the risk framework. And so um, we have the framework and we're sort of, sort of um, in this session, really sort of um, seeing how everything is going to be sort of integrated together. Um, but we're going to have a discussion. It's not a very long presentation. And the idea um, of this breakout session was, to, was for us to really sort of have a discussion about what, what people are doing in practice um, in different jurisdictions, what you hope to do in practice to sort of answer questions. I know yesterday I was in the juvenile um, segment, the one of the breakouts, um, where it was assessment and screening. And I was really um, thinking that I, I really wanted to have a didactic lecture from him because he had so much information. But the idea of this breakout session was really to have um, a discussion. So I apologize for that if you came expecting that I would be sort of just talking to you guys for an hour. So in defining um, who um, individuals are in terms of um, high need, it's about sort of diagnosis and, fun and functionality. And sort of the functionality that um, comes with the um, mental illness is, is one of the critical um, as aspects that, that need is not just based on um, that you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it's also based on how your psychiatric diagnosis impacts your ability to function in the community, whether you need to be, whether you're able to sort of work and function, um, maintain a full-time job. Clearly, if, even if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you have less need than an individual who really needs sort of case management to help care coordinate their lives, whether it's getting to appointments and um, reminders about the need to sort of take medication and making sure that the person is engaged in, in mental health treatment, um, helping with sort of transportation to get someone to the treatment entity, um, that the functioning of the person is really sort of the critical issue that we want to think about when we define people as being of high need. And, and the needs that um, our individuals, our participants may experience are needs that could be related to just other psychosocial domains. So they could be needs related to addressing homelessness, um, needs um, related to addressing people's ability to have health insurance, people's ability um, to have income support, and people's ability to engage in what we sort of describe as meaningful activity in their day, and so that they are sort of integrated um, in the community. And so for us, when we sort of run these programs, um, we need to think about sort of where do our consumers fall in terms of continuum of the needs that they have. And that's going to be, in terms of your assessment of the consumer, that's going to be the, the, the factor that's going to really sort of help you def, um, define like the nature of the services that you need to provide. And it doesn't matter whether you are providing the most um, rich sort of case management evidence-based services um, around case management, which um, would be assertive community treatment for people with serious mental illness. And for those that, of you that don't know, um, assertive community treatment is an evidence-based model. Um, it's comprised of a multidisciplinary team who are actually um, charged with going out to the consumer in the domains where the consumers live um, because the consumers that need that level of service because of their high needs are not able to just go themselves and utilize treatment. And so on an ACT team, you would have a psychiatrist, you have nurses, you have social workers who have different functions. So you'd have a, um, a vocational specialist social worker, a family specialist social worker. You'd probably have a um, substance abuse specialist um, individual who's credentialed in um, ad addiction work. You may have peer specialist staff, so those people who are themselves living in with mental illness who are in recovery, who are providing um, intentional peer support, which is sort of mentoring and peer support around how um, folks can improve their function and engage in recovery in the community. Um, ACT is a very um, robust model of intervention with the people who are high utilizers of hospitals. We're seeing now that ACT teams are being rolled out for individuals who are also <laughs> high utilizers of, of jails and prisons known um, 
uh, as forensic act teams. We're seeing that model um, more around. But many jurisdictions can't afford to have act teams. So you may have basic case management. I was in a session where someone was describing, you know, we're about to hire the case manager who's paid for with this grant. That might be um, your reality. In case management, um, what we have is that in these types of programs, in, in sort of responding to need, we want someone who's going to be able to um, span systems with our clients. So the person who's going to meet the client, whether in the criminal justice adult system or the juvenile justice um, system, who's also going to um, span with the client the, the um, sort of community, that they are able to be what we describe as a boundary spanner from from whatever the incarceration, whether it's jail or juvenile justice, into the community, um, that their role is to navigate the system on behalf of the client, to be the client's advocate, to respond to the client's needs, so making sure that the client gets access to services, maybe what you, your grant allows you to do, what your program model is. Um, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? Like, I would not be concerned about the fact that we don't, we're not doing evidence-based practice, we're not doing ACT. I, I know there was a, a grantee here who's doing an integrated dual disorder team, which is another evidence-based um, practice, but again, a very robust, a very expensive um, program. If you have one case, um, case manager, that person is going to be addressing the client's um, mental health needs, their functioning, and helping to improve that the clients are going to um, get get better. So whether you have someone that's a bachelor's level person, a credentialed mental health clinician, or if your case manager or uh, maybe someone who's a peer specialist, that might be a peer, peer mentor, someone who themselves has used the mental health system and, and has recovered. All of these folks can respond to clients in terms of their functioning. What we do know also, though, about our clients in terms of needs, it's not just about responding to mental health need. So it's not just about where we have this program, we've started this program, what we're going to do is, is link our clients to um, mental health treatment. We know that there's a, a real high incidence of, of needs around substance abuse, that we need to sort of integrate that. And again, this is just showing the continuum that you may be serving people and you should know for your assessment who may, excuse me, who may um, meet criteria for substance use. You may be serving folks that uh, meet criteria for substance abuse, or you may be serving individuals that meet criteria for substance dependence. It's important in your case management model, um, in your program service model, that you know the distinctions between that, that you know the interventions that respond based on the severity of the substance abuse problem, and that you make sure that the access to sort of integrated treatment is going to be um, accessible and available to your clients. And so this is just another in, important um, aspect of, of case management. If you have access to linking your clients to assertive community treatment in your local um, jurisdiction, you, want to, you would want to make sure that the practitioners, that team that you're working with, are doing integrated treatment because you know your clients have a high incidence of maybe substance dependence, substance dependency. Um, if your case manager, um, if you just have a case manager, a case management team who are coordinating the access of services um, to your participants, you're going to want to make sure that if it's substance um, dependency, excuse me, I'm just going to go back, with a, a mental health illness that has limited it, but the clients experience limited impairment, that maybe your substance abuse treatment provider is a good entity um, to provide the services because they have maybe consulting psychiatry, they're able to prescribe medications to folks. But if you're dealing with individuals that have serious mental illness, and also substance dependency at the sort of highest scale in terms of need. Again, we're just now focusing on the behavioral health needs. Like maybe those people need to be in settings where there is really good um, co-occurring treatment, whether it's run by a substance abuse agency. Maybe it is a, uh, an entity that um, provides co-occurring treatment and they sit. You might have a um, um, providers that do both, so have dual licenses, or a provider that um, is a mental health provider that has the capacity to do really good co-occurring integrated dual disorder treatment. And so here, in terms of thinking about sort of case management um, and need, we want to sort of make sure that the, our, our programs, our interventions, whether it's very robust for ACT or whether it's um, 
a loan case manager, a case management team really have an appreciation of who they're serving and really can link people because I, I think most folks are doing sort of linkage to services that are sort of existing um, in the community and you want to sort of make sure that you sort of prioritize the folks with the highest need that they're going to need the most intensive response and so maybe they need the program that's three days a week or, or five days a week or two hours a day every day that they're going to need a more comprehensive um, intervention than someone who may have um, substance use, um, low-grade mental illness, who could just need um, interaction with um, treatment maybe once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, you know, because they're working, you know, and so it's going to be, we really want to make sure that we really sort of target our sort of act access to um, the services um, based on um, folks need um, a, a sort of along the continuum. And one of the things that we um, sort of know is that it's really important to make sure that the case management folks um, have skills within all the areas, that they have skills within sort of mental illness, that they have skills also within substance, substance abuse, that that's going to be sort of really important for folks to be able to do their job, to respond. I always get a, a sense of the case manager, the person on the ground who might be linking the person to treatment, following the person up, doing the monitoring um, for the person, actually probably spends more time with the client sometimes than even the treatment entity. And sometimes when you run these programs and that person had the first relationship with the client as the client came out of detention, out of jail, out of the, out of the county jail, out of the juvenile um, justice system, like the case manager may have been the individual that was more connected to the young person or the adult or, or the family system in which the client um, sits and has a truer picture of the client in terms of all of the needs of the client and also that the client is more likely to in, sort of engage with and also um, share with. And so it's important to think about sort of case management as both spanning systems, um, whether it's from incarceration to community, um, as, and also sort of sharing information um, across systems about the needs of the clients, particularly if you're in situations where your um, clients have to go one place for their mental health services, and then they need to go to a different place for their substance abuse services because that's your reality and you don't have good integrated treatment um, in the jurisdiction where you're from. And so we know that that's sometimes folks' reality. That, that then in particular, that case management is going to really um, play a really important role in making sure that both things are um, addressed at the different locations. If that is your um, experience in your jurisdiction of how you've linked the person to treatment. And so one of the challenges. So we have sort of at the gold star, the platinum of case management, we have assertive community treatment. We have this um, mobile team that has all these clinicians that have very um, low client to staff ratio, ratios of one to 10. Um, we have this team that's accessible in assertive community treatment 24-7, um, that can provide crisis response, that's providing um, ongoing rehabilitation. And then we have juxtaposed that you might be in a situation where you have clients that could really benefit fit from a really good intensive team but you don't your program is not funded to that level you don't have that capacity I, I would argue that you could still address the needs of those high-risk clients in a case management program but you're going to really have to work on sort of leveraging the resources in your community and really having good partnerships with your mental health provider, your substance abuse provider. And what you want to be able to do sort of really from the outset is really have a good sense of what the needs are going to be. And so, so that the receiving entity, the treatment provider in the community who may not be used to dealing with young people from the juvenile justice system or adults from the jail, adults who are um, in pre-trial services, adults who are going for a mental health health court program, that they have the opportunity to really get to know um, who you are in terms of what, your, what supports that you're providing, um, as well as who your clients are going to be. And I think that this is where even the loan case manager could be really helpful, that the loan case manager can provide additional capacity to the treatment entity that may feel that they're already stretched. And so the treatment entity may feel, you know, we already have lots of clients. Now we're taking clients from the local jail who are coming to us from the mental health court. But you guys have an additional resource. You have your court coordinator who could be a resource to those, um, to the treatment provider. You also may have a case manager who could be a resource who can 
go to the program, who can case conference with the staff of the program, who can address the issues. I would encourage you guys not just to send people to programs and then ask the program to report back to the court on how the folks are doing, that you really want to use your program resources, even though you don't have a lot of case management and your clients might have um, really quite robust um, needs that you want to be addressed by the treatment provider, but really think about the resource that you also bring. Do you know, and, and, that, and it may not just be the case manager, there may be other folks who are part of your court team, other folks who may have other discipline professions, whether it's uh, the public defender, the defense attorney, who may be a resource to um, the treatment provider, there may be volunteers that are working in your program, or, or just the staff that are funded for your grant who become a resource. Because what we know about sort of case management and addressing the behavioral health needs of um, consumers that are going through these types of programs that we run is that the treatment system um, sometimes feels put upon. Do you know, with having to receive new clients who have really complex needs. And so if you guys can sort of demonstrate that you are a resource to them as well, I think that that's a way of increasing their capacity as well as their understanding of who your clients are in terms of their high needs, um, as well as um, sort of buying in them, their ability to buy into um, your program model and what you're hoping to achieve and the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve. And so the ability of your case manager, if you just have one case, case manager of your of your case management team if you have an intensive case management team of your act team if that's the entity um, that you're working with your integrated dual disorder um, team the ability of those staff to also be resources to the treatment entity is going to be a really important thing and so it means like going out there in the community with the client um, like at and um, when we're dressing with um, when we're working with individuals who have high needs and we're trying to get them engaged in services, um, the referral has to be a really great handoff referral where you're there physically present. It can't be the telephone referral, which you may be able to do in other situations with other clients who are not high need. When you're addressing high need, you need to really sort of think about how do we really create good systems? We know that where things break down are in transitions. So I referred him, she didn't get there. Do you know the program might be, she didn't come. There may be an issue about the high need is transportation. Do you know, like you're in a rural community, we didn't think about that we needed to build into our budget transportation so our clients could get to, um, to the program. Do you know, so really sort of think about what are the needs, what are the functionings of our clients in terms of behavioral health domains, but also in terms of the psychosocial domains, transportation, housing, family stress, poor education, all these things um, that the clients might have. And you may also want to think about the notion that even in the best treatment, treatment doesn't fill up all of the client's time. It just doesn't. And so you may want to think about other resources, rehabilitation resources that um, your clients should sort of get access to. You know, and I've seen um, grantees over the years who may be in mental health court programs have the court participants do volunteer work. Do you know? And so it's just a way of getting people prepared um, to improve their functioning around the ability to arrive at a place on time, um, to contribute to the community, because you're, you may be selling a, a population of individuals who, who the community doesn't want to receive, who are not the easiest to sell. You know, they're not three-year-old kids that need access to pre-education classes, you know. And so you want to sort of think about how, what resources do I have in our community that we can really tap? One of the other resources that sometimes we find that people don't think about in terms of addressing people's need, that we, we think about formal treatment, we think about formal mental health treatment, we think about formal substance abuse treatment, that we don't think about the networks in our communities that are to do with peer specialists, the peer community. And I, and I would charge that most communities have some type of peer um, community organization, peer-run community um, in their jurisdiction. It may not be as close to you as it may be over in the next town. There may be sort of travel issues, but that's, that's one where people can get access to, to social life in a way with other people who are recovering from both mental illness and substance abuse. In, and so we're not talking about the formal structures that we sometimes think about um, or the informal um, peer structures that we sometimes think about from the substance abuse world, which should do to NA and NA. 
Um, we're talking about sort of the peer networks that we have. And so there are many peer agencies that are run by people um, who um, define themselves as survivors of psychiatric treatment, survivors of the state hospital system, um, who are engaged in really helping um, folks with their recovery. And so they run um, different things like parties that are clean and sober parties, just um, access to resources of getting people free tickets. Our clients are generally living in poverty. They have high need that can get folks access to um, leisure activities um, and also that can get folks access to, um, to peers who are also in recovery but also not just recovery from substance abuse but also recovery from mental illness which we sort of all believe in that people can get better um, and so that might be a place where folks can go when they're not engaged in formal treatment that is also addressing um, their needs in many um, communities you know like there may be a cap on how much treatment you can get access to do you know like that people meet their treatment thresholds and so we want to sort of think about the in our clients who are at risk of recidivism like how can we ensure that people are engaged in pro-social things that we're addressing all the needs hitting sort of all of the domains and even in situations where you just do not have um, that you, you don't have access to the most evidence-based services like assertive community treatment that I sort of keep um, bringing up, which is really this mobile team sort of going around and helping the client connect, that there may be other um, entities within your um, jurisdictions that can really help your folks connect to community, whether it's the National um, Association of um, the Mentally Ill, which is a family sort of association dealing um, for parents of people that have mental illness, that they, they themselves run many um, groups, networks, support services, know about how to access resources. That might, that might be a resource for you guys. It may be a resource also for the family members of the participants that you're serving if you're serving adults or juveniles who can really use support around how to help their client and their loved one in terms of their sort of recovery. So I encourage you to sort of Think about sort of the formal case management that we may have in the community that might be funded from mental health, might be funded from substance abuse that you might be utilizing in your grant, but also think about informal networks to get people access to rehabilitation support. You know, I always, um, in our program, think about like, our clients just need someone, an intimate partner who loves them. Do you know, like that adult relationship, they don't get access to that, you know, and, and so, and that's a need that we're not really good at sort of, a, a sort of addressing, you know, like people get well and then thereafter, what happens when you get, when you're well, you know, for us, we have our intimate partner, the person that loves us, that takes care of us, that helps us go, you know, that helps us keep going. And so our clients as adults and as young people need to realize that as well. And so just don't focus in on the treatment need. I think it's important. The treatment need is our priority. We want to reduce um, folks risk in terms of their behavioral health issues but whether it's just one person that you have who is a case manager I think that you can really sort of utilize that one case manager to really span the systems span the boundaries really sort of work with your clients around sort of helping them address all of the needs that come with their mental illness their co-occurring substance use disorder as well as their sort of psychosocial domains and so at the conference this has been the challenge for us about wow, we want to do mental health intervention where we're using case management to help our folks access mental health treatment services or substance abuse services or both services sort of in an integrated way. And now they're sort of saying at the conference, but also you guys, you really want to look at this notion of this made up word of criminogenic risk, you know, and the needs that we need to take care of, those sort of eight domains that we've heard a lot about over the last two days um, that put people at risk of being rearrested again again, being reconvicted again, violating their community supervision, whatever it might be in terms of your mental health court, your program, and also returning back to detention or incarceration, that you want to sort of take care of those things, you know, like the big four, as well as the other domains, which are related to housing, substance abuse, um, leisure and recreation, things that within the behavioral health system that we have been used to doing you know, um, for many years, but you want to also take care of the antisocial peers, the antisocial personality pattern, and also the criminal thinking. This is a challenge um, for us because um, 
case management doesn't, behavioral health case management doesn't naturally tell us what to do, you know? And in many respects, we are reading the research, we're reading the manuals, we're reading the books to sort of get guidance. And then we're trying to in integrate into um, our, our practice. Our ability to, to um, do this is, is going to be first and foremost based on using a validated risk assessment. And so, so if you want your case management, your integrated dual disorder team, your ACT team, your community provider case management team that's providing the services to your client, that somewhere in the system you're going to have to be using an instrument that's telling you at the individual level what are the areas that put this client at risk for the recidivism, re-arrest, re-incarceration? So that's, so that's one thing that you're going to um, just have to do. And then you're going to have to educate your case manager, um, your ACT team, um, the, the people providing the services about what risk need responsivity is and how we need to make sure that we use the information that we get from the other assessment. I think the... the, the the good thing is that, that the risk needs assessment really provide a really great guide tool. Unlike a regular assessment that might, um, you may see done by a psychiatrist or a substance abuse specialist or a licensed mental health clinician that looks at someone's domain, like, like um, saying in a psychiatric eval that this person um, has um, paranoid schizophrenia, polysubstance dependence, they're homeless, they have a GAF score of 45, doesn't really provide a clear um, guide. The psychiatrist's recommendation may be client needs mental health treatment. You know, the psychiatrist is not sort of saying to us client needs, you know, like mental health treatment every day, <laughs> you know, or client needs day treatment or partial hospitalization. It's an, it's an overview assessment. It's an assessment of sort of diagnosis and functioning. And it's sort of saying meets criteria for serious mental illness should engage in mental health treatment. You know, the assessment that we do around sort of substance abuse that may be integrated into your overall comprehensive assessment may again rate the person in terms of having cocaine dependence. Um, opioid dependence, whatever um, polysubstance abuse, whatever it might be in terms of diagnosis. So we know it's severe, you know, like we, we know from that assessment that the person, um, you know, was using substances every other day for the past six months before um, they were arrested on the instant crime that gets them into our program, but also um, that the client maybe used a tool that asks folks around motivation, that the client's really motivated um, to get, get treatment, the, the client may, um, during their detention, had some period of abstinence um, during um, their detention and, and is, is returning home, but you guys have created a case plan that talks about the, be, the sort of substance abuse treatment that the client's going to get in an integrated way with their mental health treatment. And so I would suggest that the use of a validated risk assessment provides really good guidance to whether it's a sole practitioner case manager who's a bachelor's level case manager addressing your high need clients or an ACT team, you know, with all those um, folks, psychiatrists, nurses and social workers working together in, the, in a small um, ratio, that this provides good guidance both to your, the case management entity, excuse me, as well as your treatment entity, because it's going to show, wow, this person is really um, high, has, um, is scoring high for substance abuse and antisocial personality patterns, as well as for family and marital relate, you know, like um, difficulties, difficulties, or it, or it may show that the client is scoring um, high for antisocial associates, and is scoring low in every other domain. So it sort of gives you um, a tool around sort of guidance, I would argue, that the risk assessments do. The other assessments that we sort of use in the field of behavioral health don't necessarily do, sometimes they do, but not in a very un um, unified sort of fashion. And, but the challenge for us is not the risk assessment. That's the easy part. And so actually deciding what assessment to use and then starting to use it and making sure that you're using it in a validated way, I think is, an easy, is the easy part. It's matching in an individualized way, whether you call it case plan or treatment plan or service plan, the interventions, that, how much the person is, is going to get of a service, as well as the objectives that you have around each of the risk factors. 
And so if your client scores high in terms of um, hanging out with other people that are involved in the justice system that put them at risk of, um, of, of, be, of, in, of um, that puts them at risk of recidivism, like what would your objective be in the service plan? So, so, and so that your case management um, defines it. Is it going to be that Amory is in over the next six months not going to hang out with any antisocial people? Is that your objective that you're going to sort of work in your case plan? Is that, is that real? Is that meaningful? And so, so for us, the challenge is what are we doing at the program level, at the case management level to sort of really intervene at the risk need? And it might be that you run... Um, that you have access to cognitive behavioral training um, groups that are going to allow your client to have sort of exposure um, twice a week, once a week for two hours to this group process, which is addressing the criminogenic risk and needs that have been identified for the use of a validated instrument. Or it could be that your case manager, your treatment provider is in individual sessions with that client, really addressing those risk factors. Who did you hang out with yesterday? How did you meet him? Oh, he's your friend from along. Where did you meet him? I met him in jail and he's a really nice guy. Oh, that's interesting. You know, and so we have to sort of think about how we integrate this practice. Um, I would say that the integration of this practice on the ground level for both case management and treatment teams and treatment um, service providers is, is very challenging. I think that when we were um, attempting at cases to roll out this and our staff were sort of trained in the use of the risk assessment, they were saying, but we're clinicians. We went to school. We were trained um, on how to assess folks. And now you're saying use a standardized instrument that's going to sort of point us into um, the roadmap of what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to target. You know, people were like, well, I was just trained to do that from this unstructured interview of the client. So when, we're not saying sort of throw out the unstructured um, interview, but use a validated instrument and then really target those things and really think about in your case plan how you've integrated those things. And I think that the, the validated instrument really sort of helps us to respond to the high-risk clients. And so the high-risk clients are those that are scoring high in those dynamic risk factors on the risk assessment, as well as having an overall risk score. And so you can score medium on, the, on a risk assessment, but be high in those dynamic domains that you need to target, and we're not going to ignore that. If you score low, it's not so important for intervention, but medium, high, or very high. We want to make sure that our service delivery, whether it's case management, is really sort of targeting that. And there is some um, research Jennifer Scheme had looked at probation officers and what she found is that when probation officers just in their interactions with their probation clients spent 15 minutes addressing the criminogenic high needs of the clients that they had an impact on recidivism and so you can do it in both the individual work and so sometimes case managers are, tr are taxis they're driving people to treatment programs and so you're in the car with someone, you're on the bus with someone, you're waiting in the benefits office with someone. That in case management, you can take every opportunity to focus in on what you're doing rather than saying to your client, oh, here's the paper, read it, we've got to wait for an hour. So you can use that time in sort of a meaningful way. And for us, I think we just have to, in our programs, be creative about how we use case management, even when we don't have a lot of resources, a lot of time, <laughs> and when we don't have the, the evidence-based program. You know, it, it doesn't exist. We have to just think about, in case management, it provides a great opportunity to take some of the principles and sort of use them. So on that note, I think I'm going to stop and ask if there are any questions or observations or if folks wanted to share with us some of their experiences on how they've sort of tackled using case management to both integrate addressing mental health need, substance abuse need, and also criminogenic need. I have a question. Is there research showing what our caseloads are optimal at? All right, so the question was about sort of the optimal caseload. So you're talking about the ratio of staff too. And so... Um, Especially with in the taking in consideration of the high risk, high need demands. Right. And so if the higher risk your client, the more needs your client have, the lower your ratio should be. Do you know? And but each program has its own reality, its jurisdiction has its own reality. 
But I would argue that good practice sort of tells us ratios of 1 to 14, 1 to 15, 1 to 25 for high risk, high need folks. Um, it would not be appropriate, I would argue, to have ratios of 1 to 50 when you're dealing with folks who are high need, high risk. I think that you're sort of setting yourself up for a challenge unless someone is saying, wow, <laughs> that's a really low ratio. Unless you, unless you know that within that model, there are other, the areas are being addressed, as I said, do you know? And so the more access to other services your clients have, I, 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 I would say that your ratios could increase. But I think that, that you really want to use case management in these programs to add additional capacity for your treatment providers to manage the high need, high risk of your clients as well. Are your case managers um, the ones doing the assessment tool to determine the risk? Right, so in our program, we have um, how we're just organized. It's a, it's a social worker on our ACT team that does it. So it's just one person. And then we have a social work supervisor and another social worker on another program who, 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 who does it. And so if we had um, larger ratios of people that we're serving, we would have more people doing it. And so in our youth program where they use the instrument, the youth program is not serving um, folks that have um, uh, mental illness. Um, all the case managers are trained to use the tool. Do you think it's appropriate if we work, because we work closely with probation, to utilize their tools? If they're already doing it, if, as long as we have permission to share? Exactly. I would suggest that um, don't duplicate work that's already being done. Yeah. Are your social workers <coughs> licensed clinicians or are they just MSWs? Licensed clinicians. And I, I'm running in, we just in, we're just ending our two-year grant and we're running into sustainability and we've had a little bit, we've had state changes. I'm in North Carolina. Mm -hmm and everything's being obviously taken over by Medicaid. And I'm being told, and I don't know if this is for reasons of, um, <coughs> let me just say, I'm, I'm being told that we don't need a licensed clinician, that we can just have an MSW to do the groundwork. And I'm wondering if it is because of um, territory. Mm. And we we have a licensed clinician, and of course, the fund you know the pay payment for that salary is a little larger. But I'm being told by the mental health entity that we don't need a licensed clinician. You don't need license. We really did a a quick um, handoff model from law enforcement as they were coming in, not necessarily going into the jail, but from 911 calls, and we would do follow ups. Mm -hmm. It really helped to have that. Um, licensed clinical social worker, but I'm, like I said, I'm being really told that we don't have to have that. But you, you highly recommend the clinical piece of it. I think it depends on, on, on what pieces of work the person is doing. So what's in the scope of their professional st um, standards. And so for us, the work that our staff are doing is work that we're billing Medicaid for, and so they need to be licensed. You know, and so there are other activities in case management that don't require um, a licensed clinician. And so, so, so if, you know, and so I, I would encourage you to sort of think about that. Does it really require? Because it may be that the licensed clinician was doing, was doing this quick handoff, but was doing continuous assessment do you know, of, of the folks who were being handed off or was doing, I don't know, crisis intervention work that only a licensed clinician could do and you felt satisfied with. And there were episodes where the clinician had to assess whether the person needed to be hospitalized, might be, you know, and so really it, it required a licensed person. So I'd encourage you to think about other aspects of the work that only a licensed clinician can do. There are aspects of you know, when we had started, our social workers did everything when we were just doing a case management model. So we did 
we did take you to the benefits and, and so off uh, um, office and take you to the treatment provider and pro provide crisis intervention and all these things were just specs of, again, licensed social workers. And um, over time, me as a manager now, as a program administrator, I'm not going to pay for a social worker to take someone to the benefits office. You know, so we have case managers that do that bachelor's level. We have peer staff that do that. Do you know, I have to think about how to effectively and efficiently use the resources within our budget. You know, and so, but clearly sometimes external mandates trump what we might think is best practice, unfortunately, yeah. Is, is ACT a branch, an extension of your CSB? Are they a private or, I'm not familiar with that. Right, so assertive community treatment is a model. It was, it was um, established in Wisconsin in the 1970s. It's actually one of the most researched and validated evidence-based models for um, providing in an integrated way both treatment and case management to people with serious mental illness who are high utilizers of hospitals. And so many states um, have ACT teams, but some states don't. Do you know? And so, um, so assertive community treatment, it's a mobile treatment team. And so what the model is, is it's basically your inpatient psychiatric ward. Psychiatrists, nurse, social workers who work in the community with a defined number of clients, but they do all of their work in the client's home. So the psychiatrist goes to the client's home, the nurses do. Um, the onus is on the ACT team to engage the client. It's not where the individual is going to a community mental health center to get their treatment. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is a big challenge for many states. There's an ACT Association. You should look that up on the website. I think if you just Googled ACT Association, it's going to come up. It's going to show you where, um, which states have ACT. Um, some states like New York have um, made ACT a Medicaid reimbursable service, so we're able to do um, statewide rollout. Um, Eric, who's next door doing another breakout session, he's from Idaho. They rolled out... Um, like ACT in the state of Idaho as well. You know, so there are many states that do have, are using ACT and it's, it's a cost effective model for your high utilizers of mental health hospitals and now jails as well. Yeah. Hi, this is great. Can you say a little bit more about the rubric that is being promulgated a lot at the conference and how um, you know, one of the things we struggle with in our state with specialized case management services is there's I mean, is still really doing treat treatment and rehab options and things like that, but how do, how do we think about integrating with what probation is doing and making those lines of distinction between more intensive supervision uh, and the like with uh, case management? Great question. And so I think that the in case management, it's a resource, and so um, and so. In addressing criminogenic need, I would argue in an integrated model, if, if, everyone, if someone has a risk assessment, if they have assessment of mental health, if they have assessment of substance abuse, that the probation officer could be doing a lot of the criminogenic responses and your case management around mental health and substance abuse could be doing a lot of the behavioral health. But, they need, but each folks need to know what the other is doing. And so that might just be a response that you create that helps facilitate the effective use of resources, the efficient uses of resources, but you've got to be communicating. You've got to be talking about it. It can't be parallel like we've seen when people were getting mental health treatment and then this parallel um, substance abuse treatment. It want, you need it to be integrated. And so there may be protocol systems that you work out um, with your probation staff around how are we going to sequence this? Um, how are we going to know when you guys are working on these big four how are we going to reinforce it? Um, and so, you know, I would, so I would suggest that you can use resources to do aspects of it, but you've got to create the integration in your protocols and your communication and each staff knowing. So one of the ways that you may create integration is by having just one case plan. And in your case plan, it can be, you know, the Anne-Marie is the case manager is responsible for doing these things, but we know Jill as the probation officer is doing these things. They're regularly meeting. We're doing um, service plan review of the status of the client in an integrated way. Um, and we are, and, and that you can do by sitting down with the client together and reviewing the status, the progress that they're making. And so, so, but 
ideally we want we we would want to make sure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing but also that each person has the skills of the other person as well that would be the high echelon of the integration that, that's a great answer i guess just one question sort of in the weeds though is when you're working with a client and you're working on a clinical side and you know they said i was using cocaine last weekend or whatever how readily do you communicate that to probation where probation might not know until they do a talk to you? Right. And so those protocols you need to establish with your clients and your other entities from the beginning. The, the, and so this is, um, this is sometimes a, a, a really, really big challenge. And so I can just give you sort of the experience of our program. In our program, we, we give clients their rights, their responsibilities, and we also give them information from the outset when we're screening them about what information will be shared with the other entity. And so that the client is buying into that from the beginning, that it's not gonna be a surprise to them later on where, where your therapeutic trust with the client is diminished because they feel that you sold me out, that you gave information that I wouldn't want you to give. And in these programs where we're doing the intersection of criminal justice Justice, juvenile justice and behavioral health. We really need to think about those protocols from the beginning. The issue of substance abuse and relapse is always going to come up. You need to really think about that really closely about what will be communicated and when. So do you share everything? We do, not, but not everything. And so, so we share everything. That, and so we've created protocols around the stuff that the court's going to need to know. So the court's going to need to know about substance abuse. That's important. But if you're working with someone as a clinician and our psychiatrist working with someone, one of the social workers working with someone, and they disclose maybe a significant history of trauma, it just may not be relevant to the court. Do you know? And so, so the good protocols around communication, just think about in terms of all those public safety domains that criminal justice folks, prosecutors want to know about, judges want to know about, and probation, parole, whoever pretrial services want to know about. And then think about all the, the, the clinical private stuff that clients may tell a therapist and that therapist, which, which won't leave that room. It's not necessary to leave the room to confirm to the criminal justice entities, community supervision, probation or parole, the client's engaged, then, you know, like we're addressing their risks, they're not doing anything that's of, of sort of worry. In our system, what we have uh, for the UA line, we, have, we give everybody that comes to the program a color. And then every morning between the hours of like 6 and 8, they're supposed to call the UA line. And then if their color is called that day, they go in UA. <clears throat> Just information that is supposed to be shared with everybody. We constantly are emailing everybody. We're emailing therapists, we're emailing the probation officer, we're emailing the judge, court coordinator, data clerks, whoever it is that we need to notify, we keep in touch via email. Um, things that we kind of share in our program, like you were saying, do you share everything? Well, I don't need to know specific details if you were sexually abused, how you were sexually abused, but maybe that there was that traumatic incident that did occur. And I think the fact that there's that important factor of, yes, there is a traumatic history that has been, that has happened to this individual. I don't need to know exact details, but just the fact that it did occur. And that's all I need to know because I don't need the individual to be reliving the moment over and over and over. I Me, mean, this person's 30 years old, they've already had to, you know, share their history and share the story with 20 other people. I don't need to know it. I just need to know there is the traumatic, traumatic event. And then how do we, that's treatment, that's a treatment issue that they address in treatment. Thank you. And, I, and it raises a, um, a really important point about um, timing is everything in communication, particularly around trust. And so the moment you've not shared something that puts a participant who a judge, a prosecutor has agreed, an adjudicator in the court system has agreed to allow you to have in the community, um, you, you've just diminished trust. And so, and so I think that that's really an, an important point for us to um, know about the timing as well of the communication, not after the fact that, you know, so clients need to know what's going to happen. But the other point about working with high risk, high need folks is, is the notion of, of we know the high need, the high risk are more likely to fail. That's who the sort of population is. And so you want to, so relapse is just going to be a reality of what we're experiencing, but you want to have a response to that. 
You know, so you know in our program we're going to experience clients relapsing. What's our response to that? What's our treatment intervention? What's our supervision intervention to address, address the risk that it doesn't result in re-arrests, you know, um, out with other people that are getting high and doing other crimes? That, so we want to make sure that we have a response to the risk issues that a- appear. Right, and pointing out triggers. Like we have a lady in our program who her mother was the person who was sexually trafficking her. Uh, to people who were dressing up in Santa Claus outfits. So, I mean, to this day, she cannot see a Santa Claus. So it's like recognizing what triggers of the individual, you know, especially Christmas time, and there's Santa Clauses everywhere. You know, you have to be specific to that individual's needs. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious to, to find out in regards to your program, once uh, a client that you work with has completed mm-hmm. the criminal justice system, and has had some um, significant recovery, how long do you typically work with a client after that? Do you just continue to work with them? Is there uh, steps towards self-efficiency where uh, you say, okay, you're done, you're good to go, you're on your own? So so, um, there's a couple of responses to that. We do use the ending of your court participation as um, a time when we begin to look at what discharge planning, some folks um, refer to that as aftercare someone might need. But because we're also licensed by um, the New York State Office of Mental Health, we have to follow their criteria about how someone leaves an ACT team. And so if someone in terms of their need, their behavioral health, their mental health and substance abuse um, needs uh, may have finished court but still needs ACT services, we have to keep them. Um, But for many of our clients, like finishing court demonstrates the things that you've identified, that they're on this pathway to recovery, that they've established abstinence from substance use, that they're now housed, that they're in a rehabilitation mode in their life. And so so for each person, we engage in utilization review and and discharge planning um, with the client about what's going to happen after they finish with us. And so for for generally, the majority of our clients are going to step down... um, mental health outpatient clinics and mental health centers to get their treatment, see a psychiatrist once a month. Uh, Many of them are also um, continuing with case management, but not at case management, just a loan case manager. Um, Now in York um, City, we're calling that, um, because of the um, reforms in um, the Affordable Care Act, we're calling that behavioral health care coordination. So there's actually this shift, I didn't talk about it, from case management to care coordination that folks um, need to get sort of ready for as well. And so folks are stepping down to a care coordinator. And again, it's based on need and functionality of how much they're going to get. Some people are having once a week contact, some people are having sort of less frequent contact. And so because we know for a high risk, high need population um, that transitions are difficult periods of time, um, we follow folks um, both with direct contact with the client and the um, new treatment provider, the new case management um, person for a period of up to three months after they've left. So we follow folks for 90 days. So do you have a response? So in that following 90 days, say they've completed all of their court requirements. In that 90 days, if something triggers, you know, that, that there's something going on, um, do you ever pull them back in? Interact. No, but we would work with the new treatment provider because we know more of the clients. On average, they've been with us for about two and a half years. So the client's going to a mental health center, the client's going to a case manager. Um, and so our, our psychiatrist and our, um, our team leader, the other day I was in a meeting with them and they both got a text at the same time from one of a, a client who we discharged, I think about six months ago. You know, and and it was a distressing text, you know, and someone who has bipolar disorder and clearly was um, again having a manic episode. And so they both, um, the team leader went and called him, you know, and and sort of first she texted him, are you okay? And he texts back, no, I'm not. (laughs) You know, because many of our clients communicate by text. I don't know if you guys have that same experience. I'm like, you're texting the client. Um, And and so she was able to call him and speak to him. And and she actually, um, like, he was going to his his um, clinic we just don't know if he stopped taking medication but she actually just called you know in our continuing care we have mobile crisis so she called the mobile crisis team to go to his house to see and then she called the clinic therapist you know and she called the case manager to say what was doing and so we've we've not really had people come back because um the treatment didn't 
work um, afterwards. But we, we, we sometimes find it's sort of an interesting thing, like it could be a year after they've left the, cl like clients are with us for so long, I think this two and a half year period, that they really do establish an attachment to the team. And also because you're doing something that's very unique, you get someone out of detention or jail, <laughs> like people feel sort of beholden to that relationship and they're sort of thankful. Um, but we work with the new treatment entity um, to sort of help and support the client. Any final questions or comments people wanted to share? Just the uh, notion of making sure that you get clients up front to sign release of information so you, you're not <coughs> inhibited about contacting other providers. Right, and also, but it's more than that. It's the release, but it's also the protocols. You need to tell the client, we're going to be sharing this. You know, and so your experience is going to tell you if it's high need, high risk, you know, in this program, I don't know if it's going to be you, but clients relapse. And so when that happens, we're sharing with blah, <laughs> you know, sort of really creating good protocols around how you're going to be sharing the information with the release is a very important point.